All right, cool. Ladies and gents, welcome to the AFC Wembley podcast. We've had a bit of a glow up and um, I was going to delete episode one and two because this is episode three, but I thought, you know what? Nah, let me keep the humble beginnings on there. Let me not delete because the, the first two episodes, I'm sounding a bit fresh and we've had a little bit of a glow up. So, But if you want to go check out episodes one and two, it's on the AFC Wembley's official SoundCloud, check that out. But yeah, we're here, episode three. Um a special guest in the building. So for those of you who don't know, AFC Wembley is a football club based in North West London, where we're based right now. Uh, we've been catering for the community for the best part of about 14 years. And we've got some serious um, community leaders within our AFC Wembley community directly that we just want to have conversations with, give you an insight in their world, how they cater to our community and what life is like in North West London um, to some extent. So today is no different. I'm very, very happy to launch this this version of the podcast on with um, someone who's very, very close to me. Um, he's an author. He's a, a creative director. He's a headmaster. Um, he's a creative. Um, he's an AFC Wembley Foundation trustee. But more importantly, he's one of my best friends in the entire world. Got my brother, my bridging. It's Andre. emotional still. Hey, so I feel emotional still. Fam. <laughs> Well, go on, man. Dream team. Dream team, bruv. I'm excited for this huh? conversation, bruv. Huh? Bruv, I'm so excited for this conversation. What? Bro. What are we saying? So, bro, how have you been? I've been blessed, bro. Um, I've been in a... I've been in an interesting space because obviously being in lockdown, it's very hard for you to, like, predict the future in it. Yeah. So I've been doing a lot of retrospective thinking and going back to my archives and trying to make new use out of old ideas and stuff like that. So creatively, I've been in a really interesting space. And then obviously just being in lockdown is just a bit jarring and yeah, I'm yeah. trying to like find find some joy in it, man. I hear you, I hear you. All right, based upon the, the concept of what you're saying about creativity, I'm gonna start from there. Mm. Um, you're an author of various books. Um, I've lost count, but what I wanna do is I just wanna to touch base on your timeline. Yeah. And then introduce people to you in accordance to your book release timelines. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to start with Ultra. Yeah. In 2010. Yeah. Your first official release, and I remember these, these are BlackBerry days. Yeah. Um, and I remember just the the spike in your just independent creativity throughout that time. Mm. In Ultra, um, you said the following: You said um, all the amazing ideas I had previously are still good ideas, but are a complete waste of time if not shaken together with amazing execution. Uh, bro, I forgot I said that. Bars that you forget, <laughs> bro. That was 10 years bars ago. Bars that you forget 10 bro. years ago. Um, what was, who was Andre during that period in time? Bro, you know what's mad? I literally just said that, bro. L- like literally what, I just had to take old ideas yeah, and yeah, 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 But like, yeah. for us, I've been saying that 10 years ago. So like, where I was at during that time, um, oh, I was like 18 years old and I, didn't really know how to define myself. So I was doing a bit of photography, graphic design. I was doing a blog here and there. And then I found, um, I just kind of understood that there's something when you put all of these ideas together to tell a certain story. Because sometimes you have people who are photographers and they've got bare pictures, bare JPEGs, but they haven't got like a cohesive story for you to be like, this is where I'm coming from. So Mm. one of the things that I thought of was, why don't I just actually because I sit down and I was used to write a lot of things on my Blackberry all the time. And some of them would turn into blogs or whatever. But then I was like, what if I actually get to a point where I write these 500 word pieces and then when you put them together, they then end up being like something like a book. So then I heard someone say, uh, I was at a conference once and I heard someone say that they wrote a book in, I think it was like six days or something like that. Yeah. And at that time I was like, I can't write in six, but I write in 12. Um, and I said to all of my friends like yo I'm going to write a book in 12 days and all that kind of stuff and then I knew that the moment I said that to all my friends then I knew that you kind of have to come with the goods now because in 12 days time people are going to say to you like where's this book coming from um, so anyway I just spent a lot that, that like period of uh, 12 days just kind of writing down uh, this idea of a superhero that lives in northwest London mm. and um it was, it was obviously fictional, but it's partially like a uh, biography because at that time I felt like um, I, was in a, I was in a place that I wasn't necessarily being seen for my talents, but I knew that I had something to bring. So Ultra was kind of like the, 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 the metaphor for that. Yeah. Um, and all of that was written on my Blackberry on my way to college. 
and then like on YouTube, like, like that's when YouTube first first blow up and that. Yeah. Um, I was going on like tutorials on how to like uh, design your own book because I was also a graphic designer. Um, so I just kind of took my writing skills and my designing skills, put them together, and then like by the end of that month, so I think it's December fourth, two thousand ten. Um, Ultra was done and then I had that printed and given to all my friends how did you feel when you saw it printed for the first time bro that was almost like the beginning of everything yeah. that was like the beginning of all of my um, my whole creative journey um, from how I see it now because there's one thing of when you have an idea in your head but it's another thing when it's tangible in your, in your hands in your hands it's a whole different thing and actually there's certain things you don't need to over explain anymore you could just put something in someone's hands people's like ah. Oh, are getting out do you know what I mean so that was one of the first times that like my work was speaking for me and I didn't have to speak anymore like it was just in my friends houses or people was passing it to each other on buses and yeah. it was in people's libraries and it, it was going all over the world and stuff so like for me it kind of like showed me that my story has value mm. but then also as well it can go beyond it could go beyond what I previously thought of mm. so like during that time I had this whole um, encounter of like every time you write something it's like a passport and when you whenever you create you open up doors to just people places and and just life experiences that you would never have had if you didn't create something do you know what I mean so all of the things that um, I've experienced up to that point the root of it was just literally me just sitting down on a bus writing some stories about a uh, a superhero in Northwest London, bro. On the Blackberry. On a Blackberry, bro. Who who was Andre at that time? Because it's it's like people like manifest like their they they like the creative side in different ways. And at the time, it was on the latter end of grime. Yeah, so it yeah. was in a weird space in London anyway. Yeah, yeah. But what made you say, okay, I'm gonna articulate like everything that's going on in my head in a form of a book? Yeah, yeah. That, that incorporates Mario and Luigi in St. Raps. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it is. I feel like who I was then is kind of who I am now yeah. in terms of like, it's almost like um, who framed Roger Rabbit. Okay. <laughs> you got like, okay. you got Roger Rabbit, you got this cartoon moving about in the real world. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I feel like that's my experience a lot of the times where like in Northwest London, especially during that time where there was just so much madness happening in like Northwest London. I'm still a cartoon. I still have like loads of like video game ideas in my head and stuff like that. And like, but you still have to deal with these two realities because a part of me is someone who really is like heavy into just making things and the imagination and all that kind of stuff. But then you're navigating, like you're navigating your area at a time where tons of madness is going on. But then also as well, like you're, you're a teenager, man. You're, you're in it. So it's not like I'm not separated from it. I'm, I'm within it and like you're dealing with the same emotions that everyone else is dealing with like what was you 18 18 yeah yeah so like even even I was reading um, some of the writings that I was doing during that time and ultra not so much but in the other books I'm angry mm. like there, there's a rage that <clears throat> there's a rage that I don't have now but it was so prevalent then in it mm. and you can easily forget that stuff but yeah it was kind of like it was me dealing with that, the dealing with a lot of conflict, like light and dark at the same time. I'm glad you said that because the following release that I'm going to refer to is about the release called Mad as Hell. Mm -hmm. um, I know for various reasons you were just angry during that time in general. Mm -hmm. um, why a book called Mad as Hell? Who was Andre at the time? And to think it was only a year later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Like, why? What was that? What was the ultimate difference between Andre then mm -hmm. in terms of? Mario and Luigi and St. Raphs and all this creative colourful stuff to yeah. like I am mad as hell right now yeah well I feel like the ultra thing was almost like calm before the storm kind yeah. of situation <clears throat> where like I knew that um, the mad as hell part of me was always kind of there but what triggered it off was the fact that my grandma um, passed away yeah and I was very close to my grandma at the time but I think that like that happening kind of like you know when a death happens it just opens up your eyes to everything you're looking around you're like what's this man what are you on and what's what's happening here kind of thing so it kind of like um it's like a disillusion disillusion in time like we're all the misses kind of taken from your eyes um and the term mad as hell actually comes from a film called network mm -hmm. and that film i recommend it's like an old 1970s film but it's 
it's, there's a scene if you just type in network mad as hell scene mm -hmm. there's basically a, a news reporter and he just breaks down on TV like on live TV he just talks about how you just not like are we all blind as to how society is moving mm -hmm. kind of thing um, and I think at that time I was feeling mad but I wasn't able to articulate where it's coming from in it okay. so it could have been the death of my grandma it could have been the fact that I think during that time that's when um, student fees went from three grand to nine grand um, like uni fees and stuff so yeah mad as hell was kind of a time where I was just kind of uh, grieving and that was actually all written in one night so I was at my um <laughs> Yeah, it was all written in one night. But like when you read when you read it, it's almost like it had to have been written in one night. Um But like I was just in my grandma's, bereaved grandma's like living room with all my cousins just lying down because like it's during that time when everyone's just waiting for the funeral and stuff. And then um <clears throat> I basically just put down just started just writing all all of my thoughts at the time. But it was kind of going from like grandma to to just what I'm dealing with personally to what's happening in, in like in my area what's happening in government it was just all one long stream of consciousness can you like give like the people a little bit of an idea of who Mother Anderson was and but yeah. more importantly who she was to you yeah yeah so um, I think a very important thing to understand is that like I grew up I grew up in church yeah. church boy mm -hmm. and that's actually another thing that's to do with my reality in it like kind of being in between like St. Ralph's and Church Road and Stonebridge and all these areas that at the time, none of these areas were, they definitely weren't messing with each other. Sure. Like, they definitely weren't. Um, I have to walk through all of these areas every Sunday. Because you live in St. Ralph's, you're walking through Mitchell Brook to get to church on Church Road. Yeah, on Church Road. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, so I'm doing that every Sunday, yeah. at least. Friday some, night, every time. Friday night, yeah. Saturday sometimes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So like, that, and so that's the reality I'm dealing with all the time. Um, so anyway, like in that church, um, my my grandma was like, you would have like mothers of the church, and these are the ones who just kind of look out, look out for everybody basically. And um, Mother Anderson was basically my grandma, but she was also like the Sunday. She was the teacher of um, of the church as well. Yeah, that mother word, that term, ain't used lightly when it comes to this woman. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and there's so much. Man, we can have. You already know we can have a whole conversation as to how that all works and stuff like that, but. Um, she was uh she was someone who she was actually one of the few people who showed me the reality behind my spirituality okay. do you know what i mean so like the thing that i always felt that was very hard for me is that i lived like i, I lived in this church right these four walls but on the other side madness was going on you could hear sirens while we're trying to like bang on a tambourine singing songs do you know what i mean so for me i always felt conflicted growing up because i'm like you lot are saying this thing, but I can hear sirens on the other side. So like, where's, what's my relationship to this? Mm -hmm. um, and she's one of the few people that like told me that like, not all of the work is on your knees. Like not all of the work is in prayer. Like sometimes you just need to be out here and like be present and do the work. And she's, she's actually one of the few and probably one of the only people in my life that's like instilled that in me. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, and also as well, you know, we just got grandma and grandma loves you, innit? <laughs> Fam, I think it's not even because sometimes we'll like try and relate it to like, to, like the, the Caribbean experience or the Jamaican experience. Like this grandma thing is international. Yeah. Like grandma. But with your grandma specifically, she was so hands-on in just the, how she inspired you. Mm. Like you haven't even talked about how she inspired you from an office, or from an office standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Like how did she, like, what was the impact on you yeah, from man. that perspective? Um, I think she was one of the first authors in my family. Which weirdly enough, I didn't know until until I done Ultra. Okay. So my grandma didn't like Ultra. So this is the maddest thing. So Ultra came out, and not too long after that, my grandma passed, didn't it? Um, but the last thing I remember my grandma saying, weirdly enough, is that she didn't like Ultra because she didn't like the color yellow. Because basically the cover was yellow, and so she wouldn't read it. She wouldn't touch. She was a very like she was bougie in it. She really liked her aesthetics, so she went really messing with the yellow the yellow cover. That's just like I'm not touching it. Yeah. Um, but like. Yeah, her whole thing was like she wrote a book. I think she wrote a book on faith and how faith works. Um, but she didn't even really tell me about it until she saw me write my book. Okay. And she's like, Oh, I need to show you something. And okay. she showed me the manuscript of her book kind of thing. Um but yeah, like she she kind of um she's the person who I only realized that I did have a representative of an author in my house before and I was like, Oh, I've got no one here to inspire me. But when I used to when I used to be at my grandma's house during the summer, she would wake up late at night and just start scribbling on a piece of paper mm. and then like 
the way the way how my mum uh, my grandma was respected that like people would just be at our house every day to just look after or give us some food or like just standard things and then my grandma would just pull out like some papers and then just start talking about what she read yeah. and I'll get frustrated I'm like oh, I heard this already I heard this already and everyone would just boy me off it's like bruv like I haven't heard this before innit <laughs> shut up yeah you get me <laughs> but like she yeah, basically <laughs> <laughs> she basically um she basically was she was writing bars all the time yeah. um so she yeah that and she's actually one of the few people in my family even though my whole family my grandfather who passed away before I even could recognize anything he was um the bishop of the church that I attended so like we had scholars in the family and some of the children like picked parts of it up but they never actually had anything to like represent this is what this is what it is. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, man, she was man important. When she passed, did you did you feel an instant void or was it like over time? Because she was close with her. Yeah. And yeah. obviously from the perspective of her being an author was revealed like literally a couple of months before she passed away. Yeah, yeah. Like, did you feel an instant void straight away or did it, was it something that was gradual and over time? The thing about how my grandma works, yeah. Is that she been chatting about death for as long as I can remember, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know the words like she's the kind of person that will like just close her eyes and think that she's in heaven somehow. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like she like she was always preparing for that kind of stuff. So her passing away, she's been talking about heaven all her life. So apart, you can't even be too mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, but at the same time, like, I still mourn. I still mourn her, bro. Like during during um during the pandemic. Bro, I've been having multiple dreams of like her house, mm-hmm. multiple dreams. I'm like, and it's vivid. Like, and she's at, she's in the house in various like health conditions. So she's either mad well or like she's not doing too well, whatever. So I'm, my mind is still processing it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, man, I think that like you never really you never really get over it, but you have to like celebrate their life. You yeah. can't just be dwelling on like their death. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, because yeah, yeah. I am I'm her continuation. Do you know what I mean? I am the person who's like. I'm the person who's kind of carrying on the dreams that she had before. Do you know what I mean? Boy, based upon that, a couple of months later, you released Manifesto. Yeah, yeah. Um, which was in the the, the height of the London riots. Yeah. So we were definitely going through a transition as youth in London. Yeah. Um, in Manifesto, you said, um, change is ugly. Change cannot be seen without a sacrifice. Mm. Change has occurred more frequently um, in these few weeks than there's ever been from the beginning of time. And that's applicable today. And this was yeah. what, 10 years ago? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of ta- taking on the mantle from the grandma, mm. you then put your energy into creating manifesto. Yeah. Who was Andre during that period? And Brother, angry, bro. Still. <laughs> like, yeah, because it was almost like the anger increased. <laughs> you get me? Mad as hell, I was like, that was some little man anger. Like this one was, the maddest thing about um, manifesto, it's mad to think that that was 10 years ago, isn't it? But like, during that time, I was 19. And... Um, this was when there were ma- this was when people really started to figure out the internet mm. as far as like um, there was mad like uprisings around the world and and like politicians were getting killed and like because of uprisings and um, there was mad uh, that's when I feel like Occupy was happening and and people was kind of like revolting against like capitalism as a whole and the rise in uni fees and all that kind of stuff and obviously when you're a teenager you feel that like you you feel that that weight on your shoulder that weight mm. you can't really articulate it as much you just you, you just angry. you just know something going on and then um what was mad is that i had this i had this idea of like a uh a instruction manual for artists but then i just kind of put it to the side and then uh on the day it's basically during the week where we we knew that mark duggan got shot um, or killed by police. We, um, I was, I was going to a play in um, in Tottenham. Shout out to Charlene. Shout out to Charlene, and um, a mutual friend. She was basically like one of the main characters in the play, and the play had to do with the end of the world. Mm. And then outside of the theatre, you had uh, like people protesting outside the police station for mm. Mark Duggan's death because the theatre was right next door to the um, police like station. right next yeah. to it. Um, to the point where like when we had to when we got to the second half of the the session uh second half of the play i went to the toilet and in the to- in the toilet you can hear bottles breaking people shouting screaming running about like i was like what's going on outside i knew there was a protest but not it wasn't sounding like this that must have been peak because i remember the play was over two days and i went yeah. to the f- you the one you went to was on a friday right 
Uh, what a Saturday. Maybe. It was on the day of the... I don't know what the day of the riots was. I just remember going to the play the day before the riots took place. Because right, right, we right. went on separate days. So you must have been on Friday then. Yeah, it must have been a yeah. Friday one. Yeah. 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 So, bruv, <laughs> obviously you're in Tottenham. So hearing bottles breaking and stuff like that, oh, it's just Tottenham. Yeah, yeah. You're thinking that like, mad. Like, yeah. like, when did you when did you come to that realisation? Like, rah, like something's something Bro, profit. It's the frequency of the bottle breaking. <laughs> 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 you get me? <laughs> it's the free, like one or two. You're like, okay, cool. But I was hearing bottles <laughs> breaking. Like I was like, after the fourth bottle, you're like, nah, something's going on, bro. <laughs> so it's happening, man. So that was happening. And anyway, like when, when we got to the end of the show, like bearing in mind the show is to do the end of the world. So my mind is already in this headspace. Yeah, they said, um, thank you for coming to this play. You can't. Everybody, everybody can't come out through the front anymore. Mm. You have to, because there's a little bit of an altercation. We have to go out through the back, yeah? So I'm like, this is intense. Because remember, my headspace is already in the, yeah, this the is world. the end of the world. So anyway, you go outside now. And one of the first things I see is a building on fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the first things I see. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then like, and then you're walking and you have to understand everyone's just out, outside. Yeah. I don't know. It went from one small protest to like, everyone's just outside. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, I saw a horse on the road <laughs> and then, you know, my memory is foggy. So I don't know if it was unmanned or not, but I can't remember <laughs> seeing a person on the horse. Yeah. <laughs> and then I saw people just like walking into shops and breaking windows. And then people had like cash machines and throwing on the floor and getting little, any little coins that they can. And then, like, we needed to go find our car. Um, and then we was go- walking down a certain street and then, ga- like, tear gas went off. So we were trying to walk through it, but we couldn't. So we had to walk through the other side. And then we found our car, but then all the roads were blocked. So we had to drive through. Um, we had to drive through, like, an alleyway mm. just to escape it, yeah? Mm. And it's like, that's the London. That was the beginning of the London riots, or the UK riots. Because yeah, yeah. then it went from, like, London. And then the next day, we had... Um, it was it was happening in Brixton and to the then, point where like I was working in Brixton at the time and they were like oh like uh, after two everybody just go home mm-hmm. because the fourteen year olds are here basically like everyone was just scared of teenagers isn't it um, and again all of this was happening through the BlackBerry because at that time BlackBerry messages were encrypted so people couldn't tell what was coming from what and then like Bit of do you know what Bit I mean so then the government was like yo we need to look at the BlackBerry and how it, how things are being messed so like. Even, like even though we're talking about the BlackBerry, some people may not understand how how important that tool was at the time. And then you had like the London riots, Birmingham, Manchester, everywhere was just mm-hmm. in a frenzy. But why I remember like being in there, it's weird because you know when you're in that kind of environment, like even if you're the calmest person in the world, you wanna like you kind of wanna join in and mm-hmm. there's a part of you that's kind of in it. But when you look at you like raw, there's so much destructive energy. Like there's so much energy that's like focused on destroying your area because this is your home like you're from here once you burn everything down you have to go back to bed in the area do you know what I mean and then one of the things that I thought of like was how can you get that energy and retransfer that into something that's creative rather than destructive Mm. which actually that thought that thought was while I was walking through Tottenham where everything was burning but that was actually a a foundational thought to loads of things that I'd done afterwards Um, but yeah so manifesto was kind of like my manifesto as to what an artist can do during these times. What is a manifesto, bro? A lot of people may not even know where. Yeah, I'm so going. a manifesto is like a, um, it's almost like a declaration. Like it's, it's almost like a uh, you're basically saying this is what I intend to do with myself or amongst my people or in my town or in my country. Mm-hmm. You're basically like saying what you're in, what you're intending to do in in the world, um, and that's either written down or said verbally or whatever. And like I wrote this manifesto in order for me to say it mm. verbally. Um, and it kind of, I wrote it, I wrote it down and it was like, it was f- four chapters and a fifth chapter that was empty because the person was supposed to like write their own mm-hmm. manifesto at the end of it. But that that book was a very like foundational um, book as to like how I was thinking afterwards. Mm. Mm. Okay. So then you took a little sabbatical mm. and it's clear because the next book of referencing was, was released three years later. Yeah. In the midst of that, you went through more of a personal transformation more than anything because mm. you released uh, Ultra, Manifesto, uh, Madison, all those things under the moniker of Andre Zoom Anderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, bye now, I'm just Andre Anderson now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And then in, in 2014, you released Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Kingdom, the reason why I didn't 
ask you anything about just your upbringing and your faith before is because mm. this for me was the manifestation of who Andre is from a spiritual standpoint. Mm. Um, you then decided to write a book dedicated solely to your faith, solely mm. to Christianity and and what what kingdom is, what who was Andre in the midst of that three years? What was you going through? What was the yeah, transition? Yeah, yeah. So it's mad because like, I was thinking about this a lot and I'm, I'm actually in a similar phase now mm. um, where like Zoom, that was the name that I was under and that was my teenage name. Do you mm. know what I mean? So he's very, he's, he's he's the Looney Tunes guy. Do you know what I mean? Like he's very cartoony and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, but obviously my foundation is is my faith and one of the struggles that I've had all of my life and the struggle that I'm still having now is like, how does this work here? Mm. <laughs> you get me like I, like, I believe in this, mm. but how does this work here in space and time and mm. with people and all that stuff? And the two things that I didn't know how to bring together was my creative side and my my Christian side, because like those two things seemed very separate. Um, I remember going into a Bible bookshop and asking about uh, Christian Christian books on creativity. And rocks, I think it's called the rock. The rock in, bookshop. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I was at the rock bookshop in Harlem. Honorable shout out. RIP. <laughs> yeah, man. That, oh, man. But anyway, I went there and the guy laughed. The guy laughed. He was like, What are you talking Like, basically, what are you talking about? That's not like those. In his mind, remember, this guy's seen all the books. Yeah, right? that man there, that man there knew that bookshop from, from back to front, from left to right. Anything to do with anything, you go in there and you ask him, Do you have a book on XYZ? And he knows. So the fact that he said, There's nothing. Mm. There's nothing. There's nothing. So um, I understood that there's this, like, there's this uh, separation between. Um, faith and and making something yeah for which for me it says a lot but anyway um i knew that there was something that I, when i wrote manifesto i knew that there was a faith version of that book that i wanted to write in it um but then i was also aware that like who i was or who i was telling the world i was mm -hmm. wasn't prepared it, it it didn't have capacity for that message so i almost needed to phase myself out in a way mm -hmm. so um one of the things that I was doing, which was mad because at that time, like the things that I was writing was allowing me to get like traveling opportunities and all that kind of stuff. Like being able to get speaking and get like 19 with speaking engagements. For me, that's a big, big move. Do you know what I mean? But I needed to phase this, this Zoom guy up. So anyway, like during, during that time, I had like this poster on my wall and it just said, Zoom is dead. <laughs> Yeah, it's intense. It's intense, but basically, I had I had that because like, and I knew it was it knew it was an intense statement to make, but I put it out there because I was like, there's something that I want to say, and this guy's holding me back, basically. Like, why this, do, you, do you? Well, that's a lot. It was a long, a long time ago, but do, do you remember like key reasons why you probably felt that way? You know, it is. I think it's like, you know, when you you know when you're going down a certain trajectory, sometimes becoming recognized in that then becomes like a, um, a disadvantage in a way. Um, because like when you, when you're going down a certain path and someone's like, oh, you're the, you're the, you're the quirky Zoom guy, right? You now know that you have two other messages that you have to, that you have to relate to people. Mm -hmm. But the frame that you've now made for yourself is too small for what you're about to say next. You it? just outgrew it. Outgrew the name. You just so, went from chipmunk to chick. <laughs> yeah basically yeah. it's basically that so it's like i needed to make sure that i um i i recalibrated so i wrote that whole term zoom is dead and that was my way of saying that like i'm gonna i'm gonna deal with the awkwardness of just being andre anderson and when you say awkwardness what do you, what the you awkwardness of like when you're especially at that age when you walk into a room and people would say oh what do you do <laughs> you know the ones like oh what do you do and like and after a while, you could get so comfortable in the, this is who I am. Mm. Like, this is what I'm working on. Um, but then after a while, there was a period of time when people asked me what I do. And I'm just like, mm, I don't know. I'm just hearing it. Because like, I've let go of this person, but I don't know who the next person is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, so anyway, I started to like ask myself. Some Sorry, but hold on, because I remember one time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's where it, that's where it started, bro. Go see your I remember one time. <laughs> I remember, this is separate thing still. Yeah. I remember one time when we was talking about like just putting ourselves in a scenario of um like getting married and stuff. Yeah. And then you was like, oh, what do I do when like the dad of my partner says like, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do for a living? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you was like, 
he was like, Tej, like, what do I tell a grown man? <laughs> like, I'm, I want your daughter's hand in marriage, yeah, but yeah. I, I cannot articulate to you what I do. I can't tell you what I do on a day to day. That's mad. And the thing is, I'm doing it. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm yeah, definitely yeah. doing it, but I can't tell you what I'm doing on a day to day. It's yeah. kind of whack. Like, I don't, like, if to be an artist, yeah, right now is, it's, we live in a country that, that allows you to be an artist yeah. and they pay for you to be an artist, yeah. But like, to be an artist <clears throat> is so, um, it's so unsettling mm-hmm. just throughout your life that like, I don't understand why you would do it. Do you know what I mean? Because like, once you feel like you've got the hang of things, there's something in you saying, that it's not it, you know, you yeah. did something else, yeah. something else. So, so yeah, anyway, so kind of writing that, um, during that period of time, I started to really just dig spiritually. And what that basically meant was like, I was being more intentional in my praying mm-hmm. as far as like, who am I in it? <laughs> like, who am I? What am I, what am I supposed to be doing? All mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, and then also as well, like me really trying to fight to be like, I live this reality, but I believe this. I need to, I need to see, I need to see it in one thing. There can't be two things anymore because mm-hmm. something's going to drop off and it can't be my real life because my real life's my real life. Mm-hmm. So, um, so then I just started to ask myself, oh, like, what is the, what does the Bible say about creativity? Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then when I, once I understood that the Bible doesn't use the word creativity, but it might use wisdom or mm-hmm. knowledge or understanding or whatever, then I understood that the Bible talks about creativity throughout the whole, it, the, the, the book begins with an act of creativity. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it ends with like, it ends with God saying, I'm making everything new again. So it's this continual process that God's involved in and I get to be part of it. I can say that in one sentence now, but it took me years for me to like begin to understand that. And then kingdom was basically my way of like articulating that, like you being a person. So first and foremost, you're you're a person who is a work of art in and of yourself. And then because you're a work of art, finding ways of articulating yourself, those become works of art as well that can outlive you or whatever. So that was like me being able to like, strip myself of all the identities that I thought I had to be like, you know, I'm going to embrace something new. But that wasn't a quick rebrand at all, boy. I still feel like I'm still going through that rebrand. What's some of the biggest challenges you face? Because you, it looked like from my perspective that you had to decondition yourself to a lot of the things we've been taught, a mm-hmm. lot of the things that you'd read, how you read certain things. So it's like, if you're reading like Psalms 104, the way we've been taught to read it may have been completely different to how you read it during yeah. this period. Like how, what was the biggest challenges in the midst of that, like reinventing and deconditioning your mind and literally starting from scratch, knowing mm. that you've been embedded in this thing from birth? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think during, during that time, I became more confident in terms of like, if it's true, you can't break it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you can let go of certain assumptions you can let go of certain things that you've been taught. And if it's true, it'll come back to you. It'll come back stronger. Do you know what I mean? Because it's true, you can't deny it. Do you know what I mean? But if it's not true, then it's like, is what it is. So it's, it was a, it's a techie, it was a techie part of my life, isn't it? Because like, Real techie. something that I've been holding onto for so long, it's not easy for you to just like, just let go of it, like in hopes that it might come back. Because what if it don't come back? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But I think one, that's one of the things that I learned is that like, there is, um, that there is like, there's value in you wrestling with it. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes like people get really scared with that whole thing with spirituality because the moment they start praying, there's almost like this internal war, this internal like conflict. And actually that's, that's part of that is godly. Why, why do you think that there's such a separation between like faith and spirituality and our, our, our day-to-day life? Mm. Like why do you think there's, there's, there's never really like a uniformed approach to say these two things actually do intertwine? Cause it, I believe just from personal experience that it's too um it's too confrontational okay like i'm a strategic person yeah mm-hmm. so i'm a person that right i can write plans all day i can actually i've had a part of my life that was a career of just making plans i was a strategist for a bit yeah but i've understood that there's times when i find myself writing too much plans and and scribbling too much ideas and too much brainstorms and i understand yeah that a lot of the time I would rather write a very sophisticated strategy yeah, um, to avoid the simplicity of being intimate with something or someone. <laughs> so are you basically saying that 
writing strategies and being a strategic thinker and thinking of plans and like trying to get all these like things written down into place mm. could be a distraction to something so simple that could take you even further than those plans you've written in the first place. Uh, yeah, I, like obviously being strategic is helpful. Yeah. But once it becomes your main thing, then you have to start questioning that. Like when that becomes like the, the way you are and who you are, mm. then you're like, but why why don't you just do it because basically when you're a stre- when you're a strate- uh, strategic person you're always in the future mm-hmm. do you know what i mean and it's like does that mean sometimes i'm i'm in the future all the time because i'm running from the present because mm-hmm. actually i can just call that person <laughs> do you know what i mean like i can just call that person like well i can just like knock on that door or i can just do the thing mm-hmm. but i i would find satisfaction and also as well this is something that that many of us deal with so i dealt with this in in church right where it's like oh there was so much chat about what you're going to do in the world mm. or in, in in church road and you didn't no. do that. But then you have the same thing with like education whereby like you would have people who spend their entire lives reading books or spend their entire lives like writing thesis on things and they have never actually demonstrated anything that they believe. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because the act of doing it is so simple, but it's so, what if you lose? When did it become specialist in complicating things, bro? I think I think that's just a human. I just think it's a human thing to do. But I, but I, but the issue now that we're living in now. But say, bro. But if it was a human thing to do, yeah, then we wouldn't really have an inkling of an idea that this isn't the thing we should be doing. Yeah. Now I mean, it's, it's a human tendency. Yeah? yeah. But I think that now the issue is is that you can be paid to not do work. Yeah. We live in that era, like. I, I can I actually make more money talking about the work than doing the work. Do you know what I mean? Like I get paid I get paid to just talk about doing things rather than that. When I actually do the thing, it doesn't even make that much. Mm-hmm. Like, and I've seen this. I've seen this firsthand. Where like I've seen um, companies pay other companies hundreds of thousands of pounds just to imagine a thing, not even to come with the goods, mm-hmm. just to imagine what that thing could look like. Yeah. Um, so you have there's so many there's so many of us that are like in the influenza influenza yes. yeah same thing same difference isn't it but like influenza kind of like scene or like obviously you've got like um, people that have their comments on what what needs to be done within society or the culture or whatever but no one's really doing nothing no and actually you would speak very differently if you do yeah you will speak less less i i 100 <laughs> yeah because once you're once you're in action you realize you don't need that much words you know yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. willpower yeah like yeah. willpower willpower is so precious in it and very few people um exercise it so in the midst of press and reset and just like just literally press and reset on your life completely to mm. say, all right, cool, this is what um this is what I'm gonna try and do and, and based upon the things that I'm rediscovering. Who was some of your inspirations just in the midst of trying to understand what kingdom means? What is kingdom? Like what, what kingdom means? Mm. What is it? How does it apply to me? And how can I transfer what what it, what it means to me to make sure it benefits somebody out there? Yeah, yeah. Cause like so basically the the um the term kingdom is something that like I really gravitated to when I was younger. That was the only thing that Jesus actually spoke about, like, and he was painting this picture of like, uh, everyone has their own political decisions and what they're what they're trying to do politically in the world, and it's um he was almost presenting this new political party, and like this is what this is what your day-to-day life can be like. But the thing that kind of people weren't clocking is the when he's talking about the kingdom, he's talking about, he's actually talking about the things that we all would like to see in it, this utopian like um, place where everyone's holding hands and, and singing Kumbaya. And he was, he was painting this picture, but the process in order to get to that was is the madness. Um, so one of the things, the last things he said like before he um, died was like, the, the king the, you lot are looking for a geographical location as to where the kingdom is and, and it's not you can't point to where it is it's within you mm. like and it's that whole thing of like you can't basically you can't have world peace unless you have inner peace and like your your whole your whole viewpoint of the world is a bit messed up because you're like oh it everything that needs to change needs to happen externally and 
he was kind of like, well, actually, the rulership needs to happen here first. Like the the power needs to happen here first, and then once you once you conquer that, then your relationships are going to be different. Mm-hmm. Like evil is still going to be around. People are still going to get killed in it, but your response to this madness is going to be very different, and that's what your response is going to be a demonstration of the kingdom. Yeah. His whole thing is like you will live in such a way where like you you will live in such a way where um the way you respond to the madness around you shows that you're from a different country like your nationality is different like the your your language is different um and f- for me that is what i needed to hear in it like i needed to hear like that that fair enough things may not even ever get better but i am in charge i can respond in a certain way that can begin to like grow this alternative it's mad because it's what you needed to hear but it's something that you've been reading for 20 years yeah yeah the, yeah the exact same thing it just it just manifested itself differently to resonate in you differently yeah yeah but and also as well i feel like also because i, I grew up i grew up being told a lot of what i've been told through older people and through old english yeah. so like it just feels distant do you know what i mean um you you when out you don't realize that anyone who you read about has anxiety like you or like they're nervous about certain situations like you or they get angry or jealous unnecessarily like you like they 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 deal with the same human tendencies as you do but they decided to move a certain way in it mm-hmm. and i think that that's one of the things that i felt was frustrating for me is that when i was taught about these certain leaders from the past they were held to such a regard where i just felt like oh that's what they'd done back then because back then for some reason they were more perfect mm-hmm. i was like nah everyone's dealing with the same madness and it makes me realize that I actually can, with all of the flaws that I have, I can make an effort in order to do my little piece. Sick, sick. In, um, when you was writing Manifesto, mm. I'd say uh, just before you started writing Manifesto and then probably a little bit into it, you were still like pinky in the brain trying to take yeah. over the world, that thing. Yeah. And then Manifesto came and then I saw you like, realign that same pinky in, the, pinky in the brain mentality but more for london yeah, yeah. But then the kingdom came kingdom's still here kingdom's passed now and you move into something different mm. then in 2014 uh no 2018 i believe mm. um king the authors of the estate came Mm-mm-mm. so um, we've done you done two authors of the estates let me get there let me get there let me get okay there. okay let me get there let me get there so the first edition of authors of the estate mm. um based in St. Raps. Yeah. You said um, the world belongs to those who think and publish. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Um, like everything that we've, everything that we've ever believed, someone had to first say um, or they had to write. Uh, everything is a type of language. Uh, so all the all the things you believe about your life, um, all your aspirations, the language that you're speaking, someone had to develop this. Do you know what I mean? And I think that like being uh like not too long ago I, I went to Jamaica uh and I was doing the whole I need to find my roots situation and then when I went there I realized that my uh I was looking at my great grandparents and I realizing that my great grandparents were slaves. Mm-hmm. And um I'm only two generations away from slavery. This is like, this freedom I've got is a recent thing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and it made me realize that like, there are, there have been people in my line that have actively made sure that I've forgotten. Like they've actually actively made sure that like, I don't remember um, my language or um, remember the stories that 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 boost up my identity. Um, and that is often replaced with, you were always a slave. You were always under the power of someone else. Do you know what I mean? So going back to my grandma now, who is one of the first, it actually makes sense why she would be one of the first ones to write a book. Cause she's probably one of the first generations who could write a book. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She's one like, it actually gives me kind of a lot of pride in my family. Cause it makes me realize the moment we got permission to do this thing we did it do you know what i mean um but it makes me realize that like yeah she was one of the first ones to 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 um to write a book and then um but still i'm understanding 
that we still struggle with language as far as like we still live in a world where we are being defined by other people so if we were to say we're making a, a film it's a black film and the black film has these different ideas to it which often the time it's like it's not even it, it's too small for who we are yeah. it's too small for what our imagination can actually produce in it mm. but it's always put to the side um so but the difference between a lot of the a difference between a lot of people in the black community and and just the world that we're living in is that there's people who felt the confidence or the audacity to say something and publish it and when i say publish it's not just in a book to say something and share it out um, and keep sharing it out and I think that like um, one of the things that's so important for me is that I don't need to I don't need to write something that is like the most amazing thing in the world but I need to make sure that like my story was told mm -hmm. like this perspective was told because if you if I don't share my perspective then you're not getting a full picture as to what's going on do you know what I mean so that's kind of where that idea of like again those who rule are those who write yeah. like that's kind of where i got that idea from because if we get to a point where we understand that for better or for worse our stories do have power when we begin to share it then it has a uh, impact that yeah that, that that can literally create new worlds in it okay so what is office of estate and I want to, I'm saying Office of the Estate, not in terms of it being a book now. Yes. Yeah. This own entity by itself. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah what yeah. is Office of the Estate? Maddest thing. You're the first person I told about that, you know. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you're the first person I told about it. And if you didn't respond a certain way, yeah, I may not have run with it. <laughs> okay. Like, because remember, Office of the Estate was a placeholder name. Yeah. I just said it because it was, but you responded to it as like, oh, Maybe that is a thing and I just went with it. But anyway, um, kind of like going back to my story, like as to how I've been defined, yeah? Like I've always, I've always been seen as like, I live in St. Raffles Estate, mm. yeah? I'm not involved in anything that any, I'm, ask anyone that would have known me in St. Raffles, yeah? It would be like, well, I'm just, just to himself, isn't it? Like, I'm just in my yard. The only time when someone would see me is when I'm on my way to church. Mm. That's the only time you'll see me outside, yeah? Um, but regardless, when I when I leave the estate, the moment I say I'm from St. Raffles' estate, people have already put on me this assumption of, oh, you're probably, no, no, you probably do this, you probably do that. And again, where is those assumptions coming from, mm. yeah? Fair enough, that's that's due to what a few people have done in the estate. But also as well, it's based on what storytellers have said about us, right? You've See. got like, you've got your, your, a journalist from somewhere has written about us saying someone got robbed or someone got stabbed. And then when you type up St. Raphs and Google, these are the stories that come up, right? Um, bearing in mind, like all the madness that's happening in the estate is only based off of like, fifth. <laughs> maximum 15 people in a 1000 home estate and now everyone is just <laughs> you get me wicked and bad. everyone's just wicked and like everyone just on crud yeah. like no that's not that's not the case isn't it so um during this time when when um during that time when i felt very frustrated about the whole uh like stories that was put on me this is when i started to understand that oh i'm also a storyteller and i also can tell my own story so um what i basically said is that uh i want to i want to get people from my area to write a book that was the first instance of it i was like 2014 15 times and um we i basically said to a few of my friends like we're gonna tell our own stories and it's not gonna be your corny like oh you know it's it's not what you lot expect in the ends it's like no say say get as dark as you need to go but the difference is that you said it and like you, like you're an authority on what you're saying. But it's important that people understand this. Well, no, this isn't like some on the surface, like a couple, a few good people from the estate. You had a variation of people. From oh the estate. yeah. Like, it's, who's some of the people you had on? Um, so we had, uh, so with the St. Raph's one, uh, you've got Jade Sniper, mm -hmm. uh, Nathaniel Tyler Mack. So big up, listen, larger. Pace of life, everything. Listen, larger. as a matter of fact, to keep it one thousand, if it wasn't for if it wasn't for um, Nathaniel from Pace of Life, that like a lot of authors of the estate wouldn't be. It may not have been full stop, mm. 
but then it like it wouldn't have the the energy that he had because he's he's the social guy mm. i'm not a social guy like yeah. i'm i'm in my own in, in my own yard in it um and then you had like uh you had like preds you got rays uh you got uh caden bell some mm. people some people started changing the names weirdly. But anyway, <laughs> you got people who are from, you got people who are just like, like me, we're just from the area. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And this is the con, this is the area, this is the context that we're from. But then also you got people who are like part of the, almost part of the negative stories that we know about. Do you know what I mean? Um, but then I think what's beautiful about Authors of the Estate, from what I remember is that this is, that book was one of the few times where they actually said, they actually showed the other side of themselves, isn't it? It gives them a more complete picture because we know these people like like we know them we go to school with them like we know that you're not really you're not really this person um but the 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 thing that gets you it's mad because like i thought about this idea the other day is like it's really hard for me to find joy when i get paid so much for my trauma oh my days bro i don't know where i'm gonna put that line but i need to put it somewhere I get paid so much for my trauma. Like I get paid so much to talk about like the pain. Do you know what I mean? So it's really hard for you to understand who these people truly are because they're always trying about their pain. But that's 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 the music, the people, the artists, the rappers. Like, yeah, but yeah, but then at the same time, it's like you're still. That's why it gets man. <laughs> what, what? Listen, conflict of interests. Yeah, one one of the greatest albums to come out. I. I would say Go on, go on, go on Be mad, be mad It's one of the greatest albums to come out Like it's one of the greatest albums to come out Because like it has such a Musically it's just beautiful But then also as well It just paints a real picture of like All the all the conflicting ideas that someone can deal with Which is common for all of us from a certain, When you live or come from a certain area It's so, it's so common yeah. To the point where it's like There's because there's so much parts of you that are discouraged right like there is like when you're younger you get cussed off for like being called a sweet boy mm, yeah, yeah? yeah you're someone who's sensitive or someone who shows someone that like you care for them or whatever that's like yeah sweet boy man move mm, mm, mm. it's like actually a lot of guys are like this like there's you're human there's a part of you that's just sensitive in it mm. like accelerate that part of you now but then like what we do is that we've cut out all those different parts of who we are mm. To you just you're just you're just in it. You're just you're just so then anytime that you respond, you're responding in pain because you because you don't because you don't know all the other parts of you. The things that's really helped me, like going from me being like an angry person um when I was like nineteen or whatever, the thing that soothed it out is that I stayed I like I questioned the anger. Do you know what I mean? But I also entertained the spiritual side of me and the loving side of me and do you know what I mean? So it balances me out. But then when your whole thing is that anything that happens, I have to respond in some level of violence just to keep, like, just to make sure people don't take me for an idiot. Then when that's your response to everything, you're like, you're you're not formed properly. Do you know what I mean? So for me, I think one of of the most important things is to get people to a point where, um, like, there's there's a wider spectrum of who we are. Like, this is jumping the gun proper but one of the things that i want to do for a next authors if i ever get the opportunity to do another authors is that i really want to focus on the love stories of the ends wow. like because we didn't i've never seen it yeah, yeah. I've, I've never seen it unless it's a comedy or something yeah. like, unless it's like a but i want to how do people love like how does the mother like mothers care for their children or do you know what i mean like what does love look like mm. because we we see what happens when love goes wrong do you know what I mean? Like we see what happens when like someone has gone completely off, off key, and then they retaliate to something, and then be like, "Oh, see, that's you. You've like, you've responded to that. That's you now. That's that's your whole story, your whole character." But actually, when you realize that like there's so much love in the ends, and that's never documented, that's one of the things that I really want to get into. But like anyway, with um with with that book, we basically just wrote our stories. That took like a couple of months. Um, again, most of it was just on the phone or if someone struggled with writing, it would literally be a thing where it's like, okay, just talk to me and I will transcribe what you're saying and then make something out of it. And then afterwards, like 2015, we then finished the book that then um, was printed. So we printed like a thousand of them 
and then gave it to all 1,000 homes in St. Raffles Estate. You said gave it. How did you roll it out, bro? We put it through every single letterbox. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So March the 5th, 2015, we went through every single letterbox and put every single book in. Um, so everyone has a copy or everyone has had a copy at some point in, in the last five years. Um, why, was, why was that rollout important to you? Because you created a, um, a product which was ready and high quality enough to be presented to the world. Mm. Why was it important for you? Like, these kids are getting mad. Why was it important for you to um, to make sure you take care of home first and make sure that people within the estate get that narrative before everybody else? Because um, obviously you're not making no money from that. No, at all. But I think also as well, it's like I'm, I've understood, again, it's very important to know how to redefine something for yourself. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing is I was redefining my area. Like I was very aware of like, everyone knows the stories that are told about them. And I want to be able to, to, to kind of give a new narrative. So when I was putting it through everyone's doors, once it was put through everyone's door, for me, it was done. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But funny enough, no one really responded it for like no one really responded to it for time. Like no one said nothing or whatever. And it's because we filmed it, and then once you put it on Facebook, these times when Facebook was popping, um, that got like a couple thousand views. And it was only then when like people from us was like, oh, like, oh, that book makes sense because there was no lead up to it. There was no like posters or anything like that. Um, so that basically, that basically, it was so important that we took care of home first because at the end of the day, how on earth am I going to be talking about the whole pinky and the brain take over the world thing when you actually, when you haven't contributed anything to like your home? Like for me, that's so important to make sure that like your home is taken care of. So then if you, if you do begin to branch out, when they look back, they'd be like, oh no, he done, he done something. Do you know what I mean? Like he wasn't, like, he wasn't Malcolm X of the ends in it, but he done something to like contribute. How did that transform your thinking then again? Because at this point now, you're, you're actually manifesting what you wrote about in Kingdom and serving your community. Yeah, yeah. So for me, Authors of the Estate was going back to what I was saying with Ultra with like, it doesn't matter about your ideas, it's about the execution, yeah? yeah. Like for me, that was that was the, when I was putting the book for everyone's doors, I was, I had this energy and this excitement, yeah? That like almost felt like I was confirming, um, confirming like a, a dream. Go on, go on, go on, no, go say your thing, say your thing. No, no, go on, go on. We, should chat, we should chat to these man. Right, one second, one second. These man gonna sound like they're kicking. I remember what I was gonna say, but it's probably best for you to ask the question. Bro, do you know what the bad thing is? Go on. You can't even be mad at kids for doing the madness and kicking balls against walls and stuff. No, 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 no yeah. Locked up, yeah, 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 yeah. Locked up. You can't even. Anyway, sorry, bro. You're saying. Yeah. What was the question again? Um, I was saying how you you're actually manifesting what you wrote about in Kingdom. Um, so, in, in, in doing what you're doing with also the estate. Yeah, yeah. So like kind of going back to the whole ultra thing, it really doesn't matter about if you're, it doesn't matter about the idea, it matters about the execution. And I think that before then, obviously I've executed my ideas as far as like I printed them out into books, but like I haven't demonstrated the vision of what I actually had to be like, yo, my area can, can, can change, right? So when I was putting the books through every single like letterbox, I just had this like, energy that like God, God, God. I just had this energy that um I haven't had before it was like this excitement in it because I felt like oh this is it like you know as my, the only time the only two times I've had that is when I've done both authors of the estate mm -hmm. projects where it's like I don't have to dream <laughs> like there's so many times in my life where I'm daydreaming and like these are one of the few times where I don't have to daydream because mm -hmm. I had a daydream when I was like 16 of me having like these um these like instruction manuals in a in a like duffer bag do you know what i mean so in two like nearly a, nearly 10 years later when i've got a duffer bag full of all through the estate books i'm like oh this is it this is like trust me man there's levels to it so so anyway like being able to do that made me made me understand that like that that all through the estate has been the closest that i've been to as far as what i've been trying to do which is like allowing my area to have a stronger creative voice and then you hit it with the re-up because mm -hmm. I was talking you was like Tej I'm gonna do it again I'm yeah, gonna do it in Chalk Hill and I'm like bro what yeah what yeah. do you mean and it's, it's mad from various perspectives because even though 
you've been this to yourself a person and you're not involved in any wickedness and badness yeah there's always a risk of just saying i'm from this place yeah like, like let's link up and do a little yeah, thing. yeah. like Chop Kill and St. Raffs are not cohesive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get me? Yeah. But here comes a guy from St. Raffs who's linked up with another man from Chalk Hill and said, like, cool, let's take that same formula that created authors out of St. Raff residents yeah. and take it to Chalk Hill. Yeah. How, bro? The maddest thing is, well, you'll be surprised as to what you find out when you read when you when you do make when you do take the leap. Because even though we grew up in a time and we're still in a time where these areas are against each other mm. like after a while we i figured out that actually there was a time when northwest was just seen as one place yeah. like i didn't know that mm. so then when you speak to someone who's like maybe 40 yeah, 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 some yeah. Like, like older 40s and above they're like no northwest was just the black part of london mm. do you know what i mean but it's true because like chalk hill is literally a 10 minutes walk from my house and it's and there's literally one path. It's like is it you one path? You stay on the path. You end up in Chalk Hill. Mm. Um, so actually, people were seeing it as one place. But for me, during these times, um, the way how all physically estate really the first one really helped me is that my whole thing fr- went from like I'm a very creative person to like how can you get other people to be creative, mm. um, and what would that process look like? So then that's when I started to like the idea of education. And um, creative education and and being able to like ask the right questions to get anybody to to say something or do something artistic. So anyway, I'm I'm thinking of this new college idea um, called Freedom and Balance. Funny enough, Freedom and Balance is a term that I came up with while I was writing Kingdom. Mm-hmm. So it came from like a, a spiritual place. Um, we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. So like I went to so anyway, Nabil. Um, Large up Nabil. Every time. Uh, he kind of just he he kind of a mutual friend Naomi said um, that they want larger Naomi larger Naomi um, <laughs> said that they wanted to uh, this guy wanted to meet up with me so we met up in uh, Box Park in Wembley and he was bearing in mind he's from Chalk Hill he's from Chalk Hill um, and he basically said like he was basically talking about what happened when he first saw the book um, and the fact that like he he was always wondering like when is we, or when are we going to do another one kind of thing and these times in my head once i've done it in raps it's kind of done do you know what i mean like we was we was going to try it in different places but nothing really worked um but then he was basically asking me if i'm interested in doing one like in short kill and the thing that really like stuck with me is it made me realize that like when you're working on something you really don't when you work on something that's true and it's coming from something real, it feeds you for life. Like, well, it's been feeding me so far as far as like people will rediscover it like throughout the years. And when he told me about where he was at, like in life, when he, when he first came to that book um, and how he wanted to see that happen in his area, it made me realize, Oh, like, the work the work that the it's almost like the result i wanted this thing to achieve has happened i, d- I just didn't know it happened didn't know. but then like what four years down the line it came back full circle i'm like oh like Mad. it worked uh, bro stick a pin in that yeah because we have to highlight that 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 four years of you releasing it and somebody coming back and showing you the results that you wanted to see, mm. you went through a wilderness, bro. Yeah. I not got a job at, at, at Apple Store. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because he's like, yo, I don't know if this is working or not. Yo, let's talk about it. <laughs> Listen, you see when you're out here making ideas, yeah? Ideas don't really pay bills like that, you know? Unless you're like, unless you've got mad, like, like well-off friends who could fund you or whatever, when you're in ends, your your ideas don't pay the bills. Do you know what I mean? So after a while, I'm like, I need a job. But then for me, I couldn't work a job that was like a, a, a nine to five job in terms of like an office job. Cause I'm like, I need to still create. So I was like, where am I going to work? So I just applied for the op- Apple shop. So I was working in an Apple shop in Brent Cross, large at Brent Cross um, for like a little bit. But they fired me, bro. I'm not, you know what it is? They fired me because I wasn't even there for too long here. I'm not good at it, bro. <laughs> yeah. I literally, I have to write. Yeah. Like, you know, the thing about being a creative is that sometimes you could get so confident that you feel like you can do other things, isn't it? I just write poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 
and I tell stories really well in it. The moment you start, the moment you tell me to respond to an email, mm. yeah, struggling. Mm. The moment you tell me to get this box and put it somewhere else, yeah. struggling. You go the moment you go out to uh, uh, Apple users, be like, "I'm gonna help you today." Fam, mm. these people come up to me about their phone. They might have, I don't care about your phone. <laughs> like, you hear me? I'm trying. I'm out here trying to write books and that. <laughs> and you tell me about your phone. And then after that, like after that, I was doing a little bit of youth work because after I'd done Authors of the Estate, um, Lowell Black, uh, shout out to Lowell Black, she was someone who kind of like uh, saw what I was doing with Authors of the Estate and then asked if I wanted to do it in two youth centres, one called Platform, one called Rose Bowl in Islington. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that. Um, And then after that, I was working at um, a management consultancy called BNA, larger BNA, because they gave me, oh my gosh, the amount of keys that they gave me is ridiculous. Um, the only reason why I brought up the Apple team though, because I know you went on in that four years, you went, you done various jobs, yeah. um, as an em- from an employee standpoint. Yeah. But it's so common for creatives out there to hit stumbling blocks or yeah. writers blocks or whatever, and yeah. and, and and to say, oh, do you know what, Bunnies, I'm doing the nine to five thing. Yeah, yeah. What would you say to those people? Because you've been there, and you woke up and you was going to breakfast every day, and you did not want to be there. Fam. I didn't you, want to be you there. even tried to find silver linings. You was like, "Oh, nice no, Apple, they're innovative yeah, yeah, yeah. company, <laughs> and you know, I, I like to be around those people." But yeah. you didn't want to be there, no. bro, like. But do you know that you're speaking to the minds and to the hearts of creative people out there in whatever industry you're in? Yeah, yeah. they're on that on that same journey of whatever's in my head right now isn't paying. Yeah, yeah. What do I do? But I think it's important that like regardless because maybe you're doing something that literally can't pay in it mm. but like make sure that you've carved some carved out some time in your every day where that time is sacred for you to work on your work yeah do you know what i mean like apple store is not my work mm. during the time funny enough during the time i was doing um apple store i was working on um i was working on office of the estate so like so the thing that's important for me is that like a, a job or a nine to five or working in retail or whatever is not necessarily a problem. It's just making sure that like, you know that there's at least 20 minutes in a day or an hour in a week mm-hmm. where you're like, I did sit down and I did write or mm-hmm. I did record a podcast or I did make a tune or whatever. Um, because like, if you don't, then what ends up happening is that like, you end up getting so caught up in this whole thing of like, getting a job and making money that like your um your fire goes yeah, yeah do you know yeah, what i mean yeah, your yeah. fire goes and your desire goes and then you're just out here just chatting about jobs yeah. like you was born for that like yeah. you was born to just like occupy a job like mm. there's so much more that you're trying to do mm. so yeah for me the thing that the thing that i don't want to do is that i don't want to paint this picture of like yeah you, if you're an artist you need to be doing art all the time because actually some of my favorite artists don't even really do the thing full time mm. like some of my favorite artists are actually good artists because they've got something else to to fight with um some actually some some films have like incredible actors who don't do acting mm-hmm. right um, and it's because when you're working a certain job, you come across so many different personalities, it's quite easy to impersonate them. Mm. But if I was a professional actor, I'm just training to like, I'm just training to act well. Mm-hmm. So I'm out of the loop now. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So uh, I wouldn't consider like the, any kind of job or anything like that, a kind of disadvantage. I would just say that like, it's so important that you make sure that a certain time is sacred for you to, to work. Cause for me, I need to do that to stay alive. Mm. Like I can't, I, I deteriorate if I'm not like writing something. Mm-hmm. Cause that's mm-hmm. how, what I understood is that I'm a mad, I'm a mad sensitive person. <laughs> Get me? Like, I'm highly sensitive. And the only way I know how to articulate or like channel that sens- sensitivity without it being destructive is through words mm. or is through pictures. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So there's like, if you're out here and you're an actual artist, mm-hmm. you don't have to be an artist all day, every day. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like make sure that there's some time carved out for yourself. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So the rollout for Offers the Estate Chalk Kill was completely different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Into St. Raps. That was an event. That mm. was a moment in time, especially mm. for the ends. Mm. Um, just talk a bit about how um, you rolled this one out a bit different to, to the St. Raps one. So like even the production of it, like even making the book, um, we changed our whole like thought about it because beforehand, the first book was like, uh, how can we write a book? Yeah, yeah. That was that was all we wanted to do. 
And then during this time, I think a good four years after, mm -hmm. my mind went from making books to creating systems that can make books. You know? So um, the question changed and we basically said, how do you turn a council house into a publishing house? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you get an area that is not known for creating anything and getting them to a point where they always, they know how to make things continually? Um, so that had a whole different approach to it. And what we then had to do is that we had to figure out like, how can we make this book in a way that feels super social and casual? Mm. So instead of it being a thing where we're like, oh, you know, like um, we're making a book and we're like, this is part of a curriculum that we're doing, all the language that we had before, because we had that at the beginning, mm. we took all that language out because people don't care about curriculums or art colleges or publishing houses. And we just said, listen, we've got a story to tell mm. and we're going to meet up um, at this place in Wembley and we're just going to tell our story. And what then happened is that people would come in, they would like write their, um, they, they would basically like just share their stories. Like people who are like in their 50s and 60s was talking about how, how Chalk Hill used to be. Mm. Then they would then, um, younger people who like literally don't even know Chalk Hill for what it is. They're just like residents kind of thing. And because they were all in the room, we were able to just have a chat. And then that then got recorded and then transcribed and then made into the book. Okay. But then we then got people to write some chapters. So like when when people came into the room that we invited them to, there was like a piece of paper in front of everyone. Mm. And that small act allowed people to, um, when they didn't have something to say, to they were like, oh, like I could write that down. So you've already put people in the process of starting mm. their chapter. Um, but then like when we, when that, when those meetups were done, we said to everybody, um, choose one out of the three words, uh, change, community, or ownership. Mm -hmm. Those are the three words. Um, and then out of those three words, they'll pick one and then we'll give them like three or four questions. And then they would answer that in a 300 or 400 word mm -hmm. piece. But we, we done this whole conversation through WhatsApp. So even carry on with that whole like Blackberry thing, yeah. we try to make the creative process very casual. Because the moment you say, oh, send us a Word doc or a PDF. It becomes this job. It's long yeah. and people don't want to do it no more. Yeah. And also as well, there's a... Um, there's a there's a there's a feeling that you miss when someone feels like this is a professional mm. project. So so anyway, that was that. And then one of the things that we we wanted to do is that we wanted to like make it visually clear that something different is happening. So we had like a whole banner like in the front of Chalk Hill. So you can't leave Chalk Hill without seeing See this banner. Mm. And it had, it had like quite a lot of the author's faces on it. Um, and it just said like. I think it was October 26, Box Park, be there, basically, yeah, that kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the launch was in Box Park in, in Wembley. Uh, no, not Box Park. It was in uh, uh, okay. Getty Images in Wembley. And bro, like, visually, it was the maddest thing because you had you had everyone from ENDS there. Bro, the man them came out. Like, in a wild way, bro. The man them came out to speak about a book, bro. That was actually for me. Yeah, I get, so that was the second time yeah. where I didn't have to dream. Mm. Like I was looking around and it was weird because I was like, I don't have to be anywhere else. Like mm. this was what I had in my head, didn't it? Whereby like Mandem was talking about a book they wrote. You you, like, you had this look on your face, like like you was part of the cast of One Division. <laughs> yeah, just this smile. Just like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's exactly that. It was it was next level, man. But then this is the thing, like there's there's such a reward when you follow through with what you have, like what you have internally. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a reward when you see, like, no, this is good work, like, and that that can never be taken away from us. Like we did that work. No one commissioned us, and no one paid us either. Mm. Like that wasn't even a funded project. Mm. Everything that came out of that book, from the printing to the posters to the videos, everything came out of our own pocket, kind of thing. Boy, yeah. and that shows, like, that shows it allows you to tell certain stories that you couldn't if someone was like putting money in your pocket like oh can you can you not say that please because mm -hmm. we almost had that with the first book yeah. like with the first book um nathaniel's gonna cuss this one out but like there was there was a there's a version of nathaniel's chapter den of beast that we were like i have to allow it mm -hmm. yeah partially i didn't want it like written how it was written but then also as well the people who actually started that conversation was the funders because right. bearing in mind they're not from where we're from mm. so like the story that they're expecting threw them off because when they read something differently like what's going on here like we can't pay for this yeah, yeah, yeah. do you know what i mean it, it gets real it gets really it gets really real but anyway like going in going into like getting images and seeing all of that and also it's not just mandem it was like people from all over people was traveling from like um 
from like as far as like Manchester mm. to come to this launch. Mm. Um, and I don't know these people. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then we had like a whole a whole like launch. We had a, like an after party in Box Park. Um, but again, that whole thing of like being able to define a reality, like this, there's some of them out of the 22 people who was involved in that project. Some of them still want to like write books and stuff like that. But that's not even the point. The point is that they all, for a period of time, said, nah, I am an authority in my own story. I'm going to tell my own story and like, and people are going to come and hear it. And like, this is something we literally penned down. Like we literally wrote this down. Like Nipsey said, I wrote it down and I followed through in it. Mm-hmm. And like, and for me, that's, that was, that was something that is like, that will always stay with me for sure. So you've taken the momentum from that and you followed up on a process that you started prior to the Office of the Estate um, mm. set Ras one and you started an art college. Yeah. Um, talk about the art college that you've currently got running in full swing. Yeah, yeah. so Freedom and Balance is an art college um, and we basically What's call it role? Headmaster. What? <laughs> <laughs> headmaster, what? Headmaster. Why did you pick that, that, that title? Because why not, man? Because I am, man. Sick. So like... But also as well, again, going back to that whole, like, you pen your own stuff. Yeah. I, I was going through another period of time where where um, I wasn't Zoom, I was Andre, but people was only either seeing me as a poet, an author, or a graphic designer. Yeah. So when, I would, when I'm chatting to people about what I do, I would have to change between mm-hmm. those things. But now I'm growing, and now, like, what I feel like I'm capable of doing is going beyond that. So I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to... I'm... I'm not, I don't want to be a creative director. I want to be someone who's leading train a train of thought. Yeah. Um, so that's where the term headmaster came from. Mm. And at first it was kind of like a small joke to myself. And it? it's like, let me just see if people respond to it in a certain way. So when I walked into a room, I said, oh, I'm a headmaster. These times I had nothing. Mm. I had no website. I had no like curriculum to work on or whatever. Um, but then like people was like, oh, okay. And they ran with it. I'm like, oh, you're running with this. But then what's funny about it is that the moment I changed my name, the conversations changed. Because mm. beforehand, people only wanted to chat to me about like poetry yeah. or like, or certain mediums. But people weren't thinking to, people didn't want to chat to me about entire systems of mm. making something. Mm. Um, so that is, that name has been helping me a lot. Um, but Freedom and Balance is basically, imagine authors of the estate, but like citywide. So it's kind of, it's kind of like trying to be the art college for the artist and everyone. And what that basically means is that everybody has their own voice. Um, like there is the English that I'm speaking that everybody understands, but there's just a way that you see the world that only really you see it that way. And if you were to translate that way of thinking into writing or into, um, into uh, an image or into sound, it will be original. Like one of the things that I've like been learning is if you want to be original, speak from your origin. Yeah. Like, yeah. cause if you're, if you speak from your origin, you're, you're just weird. You get me? Like everyone has this whole thing of like fitting in and like, yo, we all, we all in our own way just don't fit in. And that part of you that doesn't fit in, that's you. Mm. <laughs> like that's the part that you develop. Do you know what I mean? So we, we're not an art college in a sense where we're getting people to paint pretty pictures. We're, we're art college the same way how we was in Authors of the Estate. So like we're getting people to like exercise that part of their voice that they don't on it every day because a lot of times that's discouraged from people from when they're like four or five years old in school. Do you know what I mean? So we're trying to create like another moment in someone's life. If like, if they lost that creative moment when they were four, five, six, seven, like when they're in their twenties and thirties or whatever, they've got another moment to like see what their voice can sound like. Do you know what I mean? So that's kind of what the college is. Um, and we, we have like tons of curriculum. How we define curriculum is just like a learning environment. We have tons of learning environments, um, authors of the estate being one of them that just allows people to just see what they sound like. So how can people enroll to the college? The simplest thing ever, man. Uh, freemanbalance.com. And then there's a whole, there's a box that just says enroll. You put your name in your email address and you've enrolled. And you've enrolled. Yeah. And then you just get like, you'll get updates on like when we're, when we're meeting up or when we're doing things. And Mm. yeah, we try again, taking that whole thing of like, taking that whole thing of, uh, defining your own language. We, I literally had to spend a good two years just asking myself, what is a headmaster to me? What does a curriculum mean to me? Like, what does a college mean? Um, 
what does like what does learning mean why do i use the word educator and not teacher like I literally had to create my own dictionary in a sense. So when I'm saying these terms, I know exactly what I mean. Mm. But not only do I know what I mean, I know how to demonstrate it. Do you know what I mean? So when I demonstrate my college, it's not looking like an Oxford or a Cambridge or whatever. Mm. It's, it's, it's something that fits my voice. And it's, it's interesting because like, one of the things that I've begun to learn now is that we've learned, we've learned how to, we learned how to develop our voices, yeah? in a way where we can do songs or we can do um, movies. Yeah, we've gone that far. But like, I'm understanding that you can turn your individual voices into infrastructural voices, mm -hmm. which basically means that you can, the same, the same vibe that you can catch with music, you can, what if we was to apply that same energy into how we structure a business model or how we like employ people or how we like, how we educate people. There's entire art forms that we don't consider art forms yet. We don't consider the business model an art form yet. We don't consider like, um, we don't consider like uh, ecosystems, art forms. But what we've done with music, what, we, what if we were to apply that with that? So what I've been trying to do with Freedom and Balance, this is my version of that. Mm. What I've been doing with books and poetry and illustration, I'm trying to like have that same sort of energy when we're putting together a learning mm, yeah, um, system. Yeah, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. Bro, the crazy thing is, is we can talk for another hour or three, three, four hours. One hundred percent. But brother, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you, bro. Mm. Um, it's a pleasure going on this journey of just trying to make the ends a better place day by day. Um, and it's a pleasure seeing you grow. It's a pre pleasure seeing your ideas, as mad as they may be, sometimes manifest into something tangible. Um, yeah, bro. I just just want to give you a flowers whilst whilst I can, bro. No, man, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it, you're, man. You're, you've you've transformed weirdness into something that's cool, bro. And yeah, I'm talking about yeah, the yeah. weirdness in terms of the 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 madness that goes on in Andre Anderson's head, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also as well, like I appreciate you, bro. Like just the the cons the level of consistency. One of the things that I I feel like I lack, but I see in you, so it, it encouraged me. Mm. Yeah, is that like. I'm a very, I'm I'm almost like high energy but low frequency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in a yeah, sense, yeah. where like I could do a lot, but I'm not here all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, and one of the things that I'm understanding, especially during this time where everybody's just in a mad place, is that you don't really need the fireworks no more. Mm -hmm. You need someone to be there. Mm -hmm. Do you know? You need someone to show up. And like one of the things that I definitely appreciate about you, even now when I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to build my own community, I'm like, yo, Tejan, what do you think about, how do you do yeah, with yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, you're someone who just shows up. No, I appreciate that. You're just bro. there, like you show up, like no one can't say you weren't there in it. Yeah. Like when someone looks back on their life, like you were there yeah. every Saturday, every Sunday, <laughs> whatever in it, whether, whether or not they liked you or whether or not yeah. you liked them, it don't matter. Like you, you was, you had something to, you had something to give them when they needed it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, bro, it's mutual, bro. No, I appreciate that, bro. I appreciate that. Listen, episode three of the ACM Lee podcast. I'm not gonna do that corny stuff. Be like, oh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, <laughs> yeah, that's man, it. Nah, like, say that. Hit, the, hit the notification bell. Nah, nah like, nah, the levels are different. If you right? like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. If you like it, uh, and the cool share will be nice. If not, cool. I'm yeah. just here having fun, speaking to my brethren about life, and mm -hmm. trying to spread some positivity on the internet because we need it, man. So um yeah if you if you like it you like it if you don't you don't but we're gonna we're gonna do what we're doing anyway um so yeah large up for you if you've listened from beginning to end or if you listen to this in parts um is there any messages that you wanna leave with people before and then that like, last few words nah man just take time and be easy on yourself and take every time every now and again every now and again write a song man right write, 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 write a, a little lyric every now and yeah, again man, man a little verse a little might, bridge you don't need to do it all the time you might surprise yourself when was the last time you wrote a little tune. But I do it all the time. Done it today, man. Yeah? Yeah, man. Do it all the time. Or a little love song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I will talk about it off here. So. Yeah. Right, cool. Tell the camera off. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Respect. No, like that. Respect, 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 respect.